Carnegie Band, good morning. So Jeff is out this weekend, so I'm here in his place. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning to everybody. If you're visiting with us today, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you are joining us online, uh, send a little comment or a sunglasses emoji. And let us know that you're watching, okay? All right, Bob, let's get started. You all know this, so come on, I want to hear you. The splendor of the king, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. Wrapped himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great. of moving parts and I'm just grateful you know sometimes you just got to breathe and go all right we're going live and all is well we have Noel here for Jeff and Kenny's back there on the soundboard for Nick or not on the soundboard but on the video for Nick so uh, we're just grateful that they're here and they're allowing us to have this service with great ease and great joy and we are grateful that all of you are here we say a special good morning to those who are joining us via our, our live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Good to know that you're with us. And if you want to put a little comment in, we'd love to know that you are joining us from wherever you are in mostly the United States. But I think occasionally we get some from around the world tuning in with us. And it's, it is just an amazing thing with technology that truly, when we say there is no time and no space between us and God, it is now becoming a reality for us that we can be in different places, even at different times, and still know that we are one and connected and feel as if there is no distance at all. So the wonderful ways, and we'll just know that it continues to allow us to be connected and, and be involved in ways that we may not have been able to do. We're going to sing another song, so join with us. What do you think about this one? Do you want, no, this is not a stand-up one, is it? Maybe. No, it's more of a, it's an inspiring one, though. Reflect. Reflect, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Still sing along. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet 
Grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. rise my soul will rest in your embrace for i am yours and you are mine oh, oh. and you Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me and take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of the spirit the spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk Good morning. I'm Norma, and this is Maddie, and we're a couple of your uh, care team members, and we'll be available for prayer after the service in uh, the in the prayer room. So the word for today is aspire. I aspire to help create a world that works for all. 
I hold a vision of an equ equitable world, a, glo a global community that supports, forgot my glasses. <laughs> I hold a vision of an equitable world, a global community that supports and encourages all people to live fully and reach their unique potential. I feel a kinship with those who hold a similar vision and work to realize it. My past experiences and present perspective show me what is mine to do and how I can contribute to realizing my vision. I trust I will be guided and inspired to find avenues of service where the things I do best and most enjoy doing will be most helpful. I bless people I may never meet, and I offer my time, talents, and effort to further my vision of a new way of living. With clarity of purpose, I take my place among a growing network of caring, visionary souls. And the scripture is from Ephesians 4.11. The gifts he gave were to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. We want to do as we have our healing prayer today. We just remind you that we support all the prayers that we receive, both written, dropped off in these prayer boxes, and those we receive online for thirty days. And we just ask that any prayers that you might hold in your heart and mind today, you just allow them to be surrounded and folded by these healing words. Do you want to speak? Or you want to... So as we come into this time of healing prayer, I invite you to become still, to take a deep breath and focus, focus on your heart center. And I know each of us calls to mind a person, a place, a relationship, some condition that we feel is in need of healing. And so, first of all, Father, Mother, God, we acknowledge that your spirit is around us, within us, connecting us. And first we give thanks for the healing that has taken place. And we give thanks that there is no place where you are not, Father, Mother, God. We know that you are in the midst of each and every situation that we hold in our minds and our hearts. And so we affirm that healing is taking place in each and every situation. And all those involved are surrounded by tremendous love. So for the blessings that we know, we say thank you. And for the blessings that we know are being prepared for us and each of our loved ones beyond our knowing. We simply say, thank you, God, thank you, God, and amen. Amen. Speak today for Black History Month. I apologize. We didn't have time to communicate that. Then you can play us out. All right. Hey, everybody. So I guess I'm speaking today. How are you guys doing? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to teach you guys about a fun word, um, which is more than a word, but it's a concept. And it's what you see here on the front of my shirt here. This is pronounced ashe. So in the spirit of that, how many of you as children at some point, hopefully as children, tied a... <laughs> tied a towel around your neck and pretended to be a superhero. <laughs> right, right? And why did we do that? It's because we want to see ourselves in what we're watching and we want to feel like we're a part of that. Um, in that spirit of Facebook memory, 
popped up the other day. It was February 18th, 2018, and it said, Black Panther Day, feels like Christmas morning. And I had to stop and think for a second about what that was for, and it was referring to the Black Panther movie, right? And it may seem silly to a lot of people from different perspectives of how excited people were about it, but representation matters. I remember when I was growing up in the 80s, we had a few network channels on UHF and a handful more on VHF. And in my family, whenever we were watching television and we'd see a movie or a show about black people or even with black people in it, we would pick up the phone and call each other and say, hey, turn it to this channel, or turn it to such and such channel. And a lot of times it wouldn't even be, you know, maybe a sidekick character or in some cases even a criminal, but we were just hungry to see people that looked like us. So when I took it upon myself when I was 38 years old to self-educate about history, it was a life-changing concept to acknowledge and have the realization that my ancestors were not slaves. My ancestors were people that were enslaved. And that made a huge difference in my thinking. So in the spirit of uh, Reverend Linda's World Religions uh, series that she's had, um, I'm gonna look at a part of Africa, Nigeria, which is the majority of my ancestry, according to MyHeritageDNA.com. <laughs> and uh, Nigeria is one of the most diverse um, areas in Africa, um, according to cultures, religions, languages, spirituality. But one of those traditions, uh, spiritual traditions, is a tradition called Ifa. Um, we've all heard of Zeus, right? And we've heard of Ares, but we probably haven't heard of Odulamare or Ogun or Oshun um, in contrast to Aphrodite. But one of the um, spiritual concepts in Ifa is the word called Ashe. And Ashe has um, several different meanings. The first one is a word of affirmation. It's like um, how you would say amen at the end of a prayer or right on. I can dig it, you know, or you said it, right? So if I were to say um, harmony or center of unity is a great community, we're going to grow and strive and um, be better people and help our world, we would all say, Amen. all right, <laughs> okay, you're with me. <laughs> now, a different version of the word ashe refers to life force. It's uh, similar in the Asian traditions to chi or prana, and it's the um, life force that runs in and throughout everything. Um, the Ifa tradition has a beautiful illustration of how they think about the world. Uh, they refer to it as a gourd that's cut in half, or for our purposes, um, maybe like a melon. Think of a melon that's cut in half crossways. And the top half of that is heaven. It's our home. It's where we come from. And the bottom half is called the marketplace. So we leave home for a little while to go down to the marketplace and do our things, and we go back home. But the glue that ties those two halves together is Ashe. Now, the third version of Ashe refers to the ability to speak things into existence. See, manifestation, law of attraction, these are not new concepts. These are things that we've known for hundreds and thousands of years, and they've all been repackaged um, for us for our particular time and place. But once again, Ashe refers to speaking things into existence, um, knowing, and that is a very unity concept. Uh, we know that we can affect our reality by the words we speak and the thoughts that we think. So, with that being said, once again, Center of Unity is a great, growing, vibrant community. We are doing great things um, in our community for ourselves and for others. And we are growing in love. We are free of judgment and full of love. 
and let the congregation say, all right, thank you. And very briefly, I'd like to point out that um, the first Sunday in March, we are having a Invite a Friend to Church Day. I believe that would be March 5th. So there are cards available that you can hand out to your friends to sort of explain what we're about and what they'll be seeing. Um, you can grab one at the visitor's desk up front, but also there will be some of the uh, guest ambassadors to uh, hand them out to you. So grab one, two, or three and give them to your friends. And we're going to have a great time that day. We're going to bring in some people and um, uh, give them something great that they can carry with them into their lives. Once again, may the congregation say... I told you, it's been a morning. <laughs> so this month of February, we have been focused on unity and other world religions and discovering that golden thread that runs through all of them. And in fact, we're discovering more and more that it runs through ancient cultures. What we may be discovering is something new to us has been around for a very long time. We've been using and draw upon the, the information and a lot of the research done by Reverend Paul John Roach's book, Unity and World Religions, as well as other resources that I've drawn from. You know, this has been a challenging one because it's not so much about, um, you know, what, what do I want to say about it? Is there so much to say? What, how do I condense this down? Because these are both broad, diverse, and um, distant ancient religions that we're talking about today, both Hinduism and Buddhism. I wanted to just give us a little synopsis of where we've been up until now, and I really liked what the author wrote about this. It, it's good food for thought. He says, if Christianity has been a journey to understand the nature of Jesus, and Judaism has been a walk of a people seeking a full and free, unadulterated um, covenant with God, then Islam is also the zealous struggle for peace within. And we saw that that kind of was a little bit of a contradictory statement, and yet that is the depth of the, the challenge as well as the blessing that the... Islam people, the Muslim people, go through. And I added on for today in a similar way, Hinduism becomes the quest for liberation from the cycle of samsara, or what we understand as the word karma, and Buddhism is about the path to enlightenment. It is how we get from where we are to that state of nirvana. As we start with Hinduism, it is considered one of the oldest religion, if not the oldest religion out there. Its roots can be traced back as far as 10,000 BC. It has about a billion followers. It is primarily located, um, those followers are primarily located in India, which is where it originated from. 
And we find the earliest Hindu scriptures, the Rig Veda, dated to be around 6500 BCE. So that was long before many of the other world religions, even the larger ones, have, have come into being. And it's interesting, it is the only religion, if you want to call it that, without a central prophet or leader. It never has had one. It grew up and was created out of teachings from many different people, and that still continues to be the case today. In fact, Hinduism was kind of a name assigned to this broad and diverse group of people and their practice. It is a conglomeration of religious, philosophical, and cultural beliefs and practices. And they kind of just gave this broad name to it, but there's really no unique central core except for a very few principles. Like in Christianity and Judaism and Islam, they do have one absolute being that we call God, that they call Brahman. However, Brahman is not um, the, the God. Um, there are many small g gods that support. So they see all of these, sometimes thousands, many have said that there's even tens of thousands of Hindu gods as facets of or as a reflection of that one god, Brahman. They're here, these various gods, to support you on your spiritual journey. At different times, you might call upon different gods to help you move through or overcome or shift the way that you're experiencing life. The trinity of gods, in fact, that trinity often shows up in most world religions, is different and unique because the trinity includes both male and a female counterpart. So in each facet of God, of the, the three main representations of Brahma, there is a male and a female counterpart that represents those. So we have Brahma, the creator God, and his wife, and I'm probably going to butcher some of these names, so for those of you who are better educated in the Hindu traditions, forgive me in advance, but Sawati, and she is the goddess of music and art and nature and knowledge. And then there's Vishnu, this is the second phase of the Trinity, who is the sustainer and preserver with his wife, Lakshima, who is the goddess of wealth and provision. And then the third element in this Trinity of God nature is Shiva. Probably some of you have heard of Shiva. That is the god of destruction. Shiva often shows up in movies when they're, you know, depicted in a, in a Hebrew setting. So Shiva is the god of destruction, but also transformation. Because the Hindus understand that both are phases. Sometimes destruction is what allows birth of something new to arise. And then his, has his partner in this, Parvati, who is both light and peace and also the dark aspect. So it represents both the light and the dark. And all of these gods are there to assist in attaining the goals of life. And the Hindus have four main goals of life that they are all striving towards. The first is artha, which is the focus on work and prosperity. And interestingly, they, these kind of mirror the phases of life from when we're very young to our middle ages and when we're focused on career and family to the older part of our journey. So at first, Work and prosperity is a focus, and then kama, which is different than karma, which is passion, desire, beauty, family. Dharma, which is often another word that's a little more familiar because it's central, it's ethics and duty. 
it is a spiritual focus on how we bring this into being in our lives. And then moksha, which is liberation from the cycle of karma. It is, it is that place where we would gain that enlightenment that we don't have to continue to be in this cycle of receiving what we have put out in the past, both good and bad. And this cycle of karma is very central to the Hindu practices and faith. It is their understanding of what we often call the law of cause and effect, which is one of our core principles that how we think, how we feel, how we speak, how we act has what we put out has an effect that will be returned to us. And in their belief, our life circumstances, whatever they may be, are a reflection of our past actions, both positive and negative. And this goal of liberation is to overcome, to even out and balance out those scales of karma, and it's done through spiritual practice. The spiritual practices they call yogas. I've learned a lot. You know, yoga we think of as just breathing and postures, you know, for both physical well-being as well as a spiritual component to it. But for yoga, for, for the Hindu people, yogas are actually certain types of practices that they learn and embody throughout their life. That's what I was saying. There's a lot to this. So, you know, I'm just going to give you the broad overview of it. So the first one is karma yoga. And it emphasizes and is focused on action and service to others, to all beings. So in that, you are working off your karma by doing positive, adding positive energy into the world so that your cycle becomes a positive experience that lets you go on to the next practices. The second one is bhakti yoga, which focuses on loving devotion to God and others. This is prayer. This is what we would understand as prayer. So they, when you're in this kind of practice, you're spending significant amounts of time in prayer in, in, and in service through that act of devotion. Yana yoga is the path of knowledge, is expanding your intellectual disciplines, your reading, your intuition, your study. So that is a time where you get very serious about trying to understand and become one with God and others. And then the main yoga, Raja yoga, focuses on liberation it, it's oftentimes where people will start and then they will in a much more advanced form end. And this is using body po postures, using breath, learning to become detached, learning the power of concentration, meditation, contemplation. So this is a, these are the practices they use in order to have that space and that experience of enlightenment. There are sacred scriptures that support them through this, although there are many, many different. Bhagavad Gita is one, and the um, Upanishads, and I'm probably not saying that right. It's, I, I heard different pronunciations, and it's all over the map. So um, they're the most central used today by most Hindus, but there are many, many gurus, many yogis, many masters that have come before, and they have written, and they have their own ashrams and followers. So it is both this broad understanding, but then there is very specific studies and gurus that people follow in order to be able to learn and, and improve their sense of yogas. That's a lot of information. <laughs> there won't be a quiz later. Don't worry about it. I just wanted to give you as broad of a, a sense as I could. So bhakti, which is this prayer, 
similar to Islam, similar to Judaism, and maybe in some aspects of Christianity, not in my Presbyterian upbringing, prayer was more than a just about speaking some words. It involves the whole body. It involves the voice. It involves movement. It involves and encompasses all parts of being are brought into their prayer time. And I wanted to share with you a common prayer that is chanted daily. This is one of their daily, so we might think of it as the Lord's Prayer for traditional Christians that they use in their daily devotional. Um, this is, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This has been integral, an integral prayer. And this is the English translation of it. It says, Om. And I'm going to speak about OM in just a moment. On the physical, mental, and spiritual realms, all levels of being, let us meditate on the light of the sun, which represents God. And may our thoughts be inspired by this divine light. OM is the most sacred word in the Hindu tradition. It has become more popularized as as Western people have become more and more aware and used in meditations. It is the very sound of creation. It is the impulse of the universe. So when you use that vocalization of Om, you are calling forth the full creative energy of all that there is. I had intended for us to do an Om meditation today to give you a little opportunity to see how it feels and apparently the spirits of many of you said no I don't want to do that because I couldn't get it to work <laughs> uh, so and I don't have the right voice to lead you in an own meditation but what I'm going to invite you to do as we move into our time of meditation is to allow that word to resonate within you if you're brave and you want to do your own ohm in a vocal way, you can use this space to do this and allow others to feel that vibration. I know some of you have beautiful voices and you can do this and guide us through it. I'm looking at Audrey right here. She could own us all. And, uh, and if not just as we get to that place of quiet, allow the thoughts of this creative energy to move and resonate with you in mind and heart. So I just invite us all to kind of get to a place where we're comfortable, to take a deep breath and let all of these ideas and facts and information that we've just been downloading, breathe and just let it go for a moment. Let it go in to a place where we can draw upon it later if we choose to. We let the remnants of that powerful spiritual essence that's common to all who are seeking to understand and to know this one we call God. And as you continue just to breathe naturally and normally, you might want to close your eyes if you haven't, if that's comfortable for you, so that you can just bring all of your attention inward. And allow that sound, the eternal universal sound of OM, to resonate in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit.
And for those of you who are vocally oming, just take a moment once you finish this last and feel that vibration moving in and you in and through you. We have been given that creative, co-creative power and energy. And we give thanks for this brief moment in which we have aligned that power within us with the power of light, the power of love, the power of creation for good. And as we bring our attention back to this time and to this space, we take with us this tool that we can call into our own space at any moment. We can call the very energy of God and all the power that comes with it into our own lives. And we simply say thank you. Thank you for those of you who felt empowered. I loved it. I love the sound in here. So our second one that we're looking at today, our second major religion, is Buddhism. Many would see those very similar, but actually, although Buddhism has incorporated some of the Hindu understandings and beliefs, it started as its own unique path. It also arose out of India some 2,500 years ago, and it had a very central focus, the one that we know of as the Buddha. There are about 470 million people who identify with Buddhism, and even though this arose out of India, they primarily now reside in China, and other Asian countries, Korea, Japan, Buddhism is the primary um, religion that people practice there. And what's interesting is that the Buddha did not try and, and lay out any kind of theological explanations about God, about humanity, about the world, about why we're here. He didn't try and address any kind of understanding rather encouraged people and, and invited people to practice how we can relieve our suffering and propel us towards self-transformation. The core of the doctrine of Buddhism is encapsulated in what have now been sort of synthesized to the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. So there's a lot of different things to try and grasp about this. But the four noble truths are simply this, that life is full of suffering. It is an escapable part of this human journey. And the suffering arises from our inclination to grasp or to crave desire in some way, and to grasp it and crave it because we don't want it to go away. We want things and to feel some sense of permanence, even though we know life is impermanent. The third truth is that we can lessen our suffering when that craving and desire is overcome. And finally, the fourth noble truth is the way that you do that is through this eightfold path, or what the Buddha called the middle way. It's not giving up everything, it's not indulging in everything, but finding the middle path that allows us to experience life, but from a place of greater peace, from a place of greater trust. So the Eightfold Path really is kind of broken up into a couple different things, and it can seem kind of similar in some ways to unity. I think Charles Fillmore studied Buddhism and took the pieces that he liked out of it and said, yes, we're going to incorporate that into our new understanding of Christianity. The first two start with right understanding and right thought. So when our understanding and our thought become aligned in this place of 
not holding on to anything, but simply being, I will call it, in the flow, if you will, then they help us to see things as they really are with compassion. And the second set is right speech, right actions, and right livelihood. So it is about how we engage in the world in that same balanced state, or the way he describes it, in order to live a more virtuous life. We might label that as righteous life from the, the Christian word that would describe that same kind of thing. And then the last three of this eightfold path focus on right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So this is the meditative practices, the part where we can get ourselves in that alignment that help us go and live these other ways. Buddhism does also include this idea of karma as a way to understand this necessary cycle until nirvana or that state of enlightenment or what we might call heaven on earth. Give it whatever we're, that oneness with God. Until that's reached, we go through this cycle. Our mind and our actions can trap us in this endless cycle of karma and our mind and our actions can free us from this cycle of karma. I think this is a way that we can understand this journey that we seem to take through humankind. And I always question, well, why did we only get one shot? You know, this was my big, big question out of Christianity was we're put on the earth, we weren't really equipped. We had one shot at it, and then it was going to be this eternal heaven or hell experience. Reincarnation is a way to help understand that. Some in unity believe in it, some in unity do not, and I offer it as an option for you to look into, to, to embrace if it speaks to you, or as we say in unity, you know, if, it's, if it doesn't resonate with you, then we like to take what works and you can leave the rest. Charles Fillmore saw that as the path in which we would fully awaken to our own Christ nature, which is what the goal is from his perspective, that it was just the cycles we had to go through until we could fully get there. The main golden threads that we find in both Hinduism, Buddhism, and unity is the practice piece of it. Theologically, we may see things a little different, but that this is not something that we can just think about and ponder. It's not something that we can just even speak about, but we have to live it. That is our fifth principle. When we awaken to the truth as we understand it, then it's not enough to just know it. We have to embody it, and we have to share it in the way that we live our lives. Through our words, through our actions, we demonstrate the truth that we know. If we say we believe that there is a loving God and I am love, then part of that truth is to demonstrate that in our everyday actions. To be a Hindu, if you sum it all up, is to conduct life. How do they know they're living a successful life? To conduct life with compassion, with honesty, with prayer, and with self-restraint. The Buddha himself summed up this path of life very simply. It's like, it's not all that difficult. You know, this is what he tried to get people to see. You're off into all of these intellectual realms. It's very simple. He said this, avoid all evil, cultivate good, purify your mind. And you're on the path. Central to all of those two is the awareness that we have been given what we need in order to do that. We have been brought into this human journey with the fullness of God's love, of God's possibilities. It's our choice whether we embrace them, whether we live them, 
or whether we choose some other path. This is the choice that Hinduism and Buddhism offer to each people who follow them. The choice is yours. Here's the process. Here's the practice. You decide what you're going to do with it. And that is the beauty, I think, of knowing that we've been gifted it. And it's up to us to take that and bring that light out into the world. The choice is ours. We've been given everything we need. Even the sparrow has a place to lay its head. So why would I let worry steal my breath? Even the roses you have glowed in brilliant red. Still I'm the one you love. You give me everything, you give me everything, you give me everything I need. Push and pull at your command So you can still my heart with your hand You tell the seasons When it's time for them to turn So I will trust you even when it hurts You give me Everything you give me, everything you give me. When I can't hear you, show me. When I can't stand, you carry me. When I'm lost, you will find me. When I'm weak, you are mighty. You are
Thank you, thank you. We love it when Noelle is joining us, because you know we're going to get some good music. Yeah. Well, it is our opportunity now to share of our financial good with this ministry. In just a moment, the ushers are going to invite you to come up row by row. And in the large basket, you can place your gift. Or if this is not your Sunday to share, just simply put your hand over and add your energy to it. See that abundance flowing in and out of this ministry. And then take an affirmation to bless you this week from the smaller baskets. We're also starting today our 40 Days of Lent Challenge. Typically, the way we understand Lent is of time to renew our thoughts, to let go, release, fast from those thoughts that don't serve us, and to renew ourselves with more positive thoughts. But we're also asking people to practice this in an outer way, if you will, and perhaps there's something or some area that you would be willing to not necessarily invest your financial money in and instead be willing to share it with the church. We're going to be splitting whatever comes in over the next 40 days between our general fund and between um, our beautification, landscaping, uh, drought-resistant planning that's happening. We actually do have a team. Kenny back there um, is on that team along with Susan Spradlin and uh, Debbie Holt, and they have been meeting this first phase is going to be a lot of clearing. So it's removing a lot of dead bushes and really cleaning that area up before they start adding to it. So we want to help them have the funds to be able to do that. So let it, and there's some jars. If you want to use the jars, um, we, we've got some out there. One of the things that I'm going to do, and I know a lot of you women have this, and, and I'm also going to raid my husband's ch change drawer, because as a woman, we throw our change into our purse, and I have many purses as you switch out purchase, purses, and I don't go get that change, and there's change in my car, and there's, there is change literally all over the place. So I'm going to go through the drawers and the old purses and just see how much I can collect of money that's just been sitting there somewhere, not doing any good, um, sitting in the dark, and bring it back to the light and put it back into circulation. So let us take what we offer today into our hands and into our hearts and join and bless it. Together, divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, Father, Mother God.
Good morning. If you're watching us for the first time, we're glad you have chosen to join us. We invite you to visit our website and fill out the Connect card. And if you're local, we invite you to visit in person. If you're visiting us in person for the first time, please complete a visitor card found in the pew pocket in front of you or at the visitor desk in the lobby and drop it in the box at the back of the sanctuary or on your way out. Recently, when Mary opened our water bill and saw that it was $1,800 for the month, <laughs> she texted Keith Bailey for help before calling the city. Keith didn't miss a beat and was here in no time at all checking the meter, noticing it wasn't spinning, indicating there wasn't a leak, which was the initial concern. Keith is always here for us, getting here quickly in emergency situations and making time to diagnose and repair, emergency or not. The things Keith has done for us, charging only for parts most often, are too numerous to list. Oh, as for the water bill? Turns out a new meter reader had noted an incorrect read. <laughs> Sigh of relief. So to Keith, for all you do, we love you, we bless you, we truly appreciate you, and we behold the Christ in you. Namaste. A little bit long today, and we appreciate your patience, yes. Um, I, I did want to take just a moment. Um, as many of you know, uh, longtime member John Brookshire and beloved husband of June made his transition in January. And in addition to being very active in this church for, I don't know, I don't decades. Know. We won't count. Yeah, decades, let's say. He was also very um, involved in... Uh, a Search for God group um, based on the teachings of Edgar Cayce. And that group, um, in honor of John, chose to come together and um, purchase a leaf for him. Our Tree of Life, which is out in the hallway near the restrooms, um, is a beautiful place that we honor and remember many, many different members in this. So June, um, to honor John, we are so blessed to add this to our tree of life. It says, John Brookshire, with love, your A.R.E. family. Thank you so much. And at the end, A.R.E., and uh, he is blessed on his new journey. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yeah, put we'll put that up for you. Yes, we will. And we're grateful to that group for adding John to our list. All right. We got announcements, and then we'll be bringing our kids in. Just click it. Just, just go down. <laughs> oh. You got it. <laughs> or not. Just, just. Here's what's coming up at Center of Unity. See, it makes me come all the way back. You're invited to give up and give back through our 40-day Lent Challenge. <laughs> Abundance jars will be available beginning February 19th to support you in gathering your increased financial good. Then, on Easter morning, or before, we will celebrate this added abundance to support the ongoing mission of Center of Unity by donating our collection jars. Wednesday, February 22nd is the beginning of Lent this year. You're invited to visit between the hours of 9.30 a.m. and 4 p.m., for a self-directed, symbolic sprinkling of ashes and communion in the prayer and meditation room. Be prepared to be touched by the power of spirit and moved from within as author, intuitive, and spiritual teacher Jennifer Farmer brings the spirit world closer to you. You're sure to leave feeling amazed and inspired. Register by February 28th and bring up to two guests for $15 each with one full price registration. Visit the COU website or app to register. The choir will once again begin practicing on Sundays at 8.30 a.m. Everyone is welcome and no tryout is required. So lift up your voices and join with us. Please seek an Air Burgess if you have any questions. Sign up for the Committed Giving Program and get a $25 gift card to the restaurant of your choice. 
You can sign up for any amount and you can cancel whenever you'd like. Please see Mary Salerno to sign up. There are multiple ways you can make a donation to Center of Unity. You can drop your donation off at the church, mail it to our P.O. Box, visit our website, or use the COU or Venmo app. Your continued support is greatly appreciated. Okay, so... Yeah, what? they should oh, be waiting. The doors They're are ready. already flung open. Okay, <laughs> let's go. Bring those kids in. Ready? This little light of mine. Good morning, everybody. And we have some folks here. They, they'll tell you about what they did today and what they learned. Today we made little lightsabers. You can't always take the easy way out. Um, we made lightsabers to get rid of the dark thoughts. All right, we'll be continuing this right up to Palm Sunday. All right, let's sing the peace right, song. You want to sing the peace song? Everybody stand and let's sing our peace song and go out and have a great week. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin. into this day, into this week, knowing that we have been given everything that we need to live and to express a light, a, a life of light and love, we go knowing our prayer for protection. Together, the light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God, and the presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. 